In this tutorial, we're going to talk about the specific case of a three-layer system for Fresnel reflections where we get anti-reflection. We get the reflection coefficient Rs to be zero. There's a whole bunch of interesting things that happen in this case. So the AR condition is that we're going to have Rs equals zero. And what that allows us to do is think about what's happening at the two boundaries. So at the first boundary, the anti-reflection coefficient, here's the boundary, means that there's an incident wave and a FS wave and a GS wave, these three. So we've got a one amplitude of that going out. We've got an FS and a GS. But the important thing is that there's no fourth wave. There are only three waves. The other thing that's important to note is if we consider this problem happening away from total internal reflection, then KX and QX are real. We're going to limit ourselves to these cases, which include the typical case of normal incidence for anti-reflection. But in general, as long as Kx and Qx are real, if these two things are true, the reason that's important is remember what happened for the single interface case. You may remember that for single interface, well, that's another time when we had the mathematics of just three waves. We had incident reflected and transmitted. This middle section didn't exist. In that case, the reflection coefficient, for instance, was equal to kx minus qx over kx plus qx. And the point is that when kx and qx are both real, and there are only three waves so that the math turns out to be something simple like this, you get that the reflection coefficient is completely real. And that's also true for the transmission coefficient. And it's a generally true thing. When there are only three waves and Kx and Qx are real, it means that the two beams here, Fs and Gs, since they both have real coefficients, it means that Fs and Gs are in phase with each other at that boundary. Now I write in phase. That allows for the possibility that they're 180 degrees out of phase as well. It means that they extremize at the same time at the boundary. Let's draw that boundary off to the side here just to sort of get the idea here. What it means is that if we draw a little vector for what FS oscillation looks like right here at the boundary, at some point when it's maximized, here I'll draw the dashed line to sort of indicate this is the oscillation it's making. But if it's maximizing at this value here, and I'll draw FS to tell you which one we're talking about, then the GS beam, which also contributes field right at the boundary, because the reflection, because these two coefficients are both real, and x equals zero here, the GS oscillation maybe looks something like this and it extremizes at the same time that FS extremizes and in fact it's also in phase with the contribution from the one beam on the left so that beam there's the one beam and that's what it's con contributing on the left hand side and here's that balance that we've seen from other tutorials that FS plus GS the total electric field on the right equals one the total electric field on the left and we'll see in a minute visually what it means for the FS and GS these two counter propagating beams to be in phase or anti-phase at the boundary before we do that, let's quickly show that boundary two has exactly the same sort of situation. At the second boundary, we have FS and GS coming in. There's the FS and GS 
beams, and we've only got one beam coming out. It's the TS beam, the only thing coming out. So we've got amplitude TS for that. We've got FS and GS here, as we did before. And we can say the same thing. There's still only three waves. All of these beams have real values of Kx and Qx. That's how we're choosing the problem. No total internal reflection here. And so once again, Fs and Gs are in phase at this boundary too. Again, in phase, by which I really mean they're extremizing at the same time. So let's look at an animation of what it means for beams for counterpropagating plane waves with the same wavelength to be either in phase or out of phase or somewhere in between. So to do that, I'm going to bring in a Mathematica animation. So here is a Mathematica script. And let me start it running. So what you see here is you have a, a superposition on the bottom of a black wave moving to the right and a blue reflected wave moving to the left. And up on top, you see the envelope. This is a partial standing wave. You saw that the red beam, the red wave was advancing to the right, but also had an oscillatory component to it as it advanced. Let's just see a little more of that. So here's that red wave advancing to the right but also oscillating, sort of looking like a standing wave, having those properties as well. What we see right here, this is that boundary at x equals 0, where we're drawing that here. Here's fs and gs. And what you'll notice over here is that we look like we're in a region of an anti-node. We have a situation where the amplitude of the wave envelope is largest at x equals 0. And if you look at the oscillations, here, you can see that the black and the blue are extremizing in the same sign together. When they're both above minus 3, that's the midline of this plot, they both go extremize above it together and below it together. And that's why you get an antinode there. And you have to get either a node or an antinode at x equals 0 if you have the two waves extremizing at the same time. If they extremize in the same direction, then that's when the field gets to be the largest that it ever can be in its envelope. If you have the GS extremize negative when the FS extremizes positive, then you'll get a node there. And you can get that if I change the backward wave amplitude from being a positive quantity to being a negative quantity negative 0.5 instead of positive 0.5, you see now I get a node, I get the smallest possible value. This is when the black and the blue are extremizing in opposite directions as they cycle. So here you see they're out of 180 degrees out of phase with each other. And so we get a minimum in the envelope here. So this makes us think about nodes and antinodes. As long as FS and GS are in phase with each other with a possible sign flip, you're always going to have a node or an antinode at x equals 0. Well, the reason why this is really important is because we have to have that same condition apply at the second boundary. Because again, we only have three waves, and all the reflection and transmission coefficients are real, so the waves have that relationship to each other. So let's look at the other end of the piece of glass here, this material is exactly two wavelengths thick. So and you'll notice that when I've got a node here, in this case I have also a node at this other end over here. Th so it's possible if I have a material that's a, an exact number of, in of wavelengths thick that I'll have a node at this end and at this end. So this is a special length where it is possible to satisfy the boundary conditions at both of these boundaries. The important take home message from this tutorial is that only at special thicknesses is that the case. If I now change the thickness of this material by some arbitrary amount, maybe so now it's 2.3 wavelengths wide, you'll 
you'll notice that although we still have a node here, the waves still have the proper phase at, z, at x equals zero to get an, uh, a node. I have neither a node nor an anti-node at this end. The relative phase of these two waves, which is set up by having to have an extreme, they both extremize here at the same time, these, they don't extremize at the same time here. When I run this, you can see that these waves are extremizing at, op at the same time here, one positive, one negative, but here they don't extremize at the same time. When the blue gets to its highest point, that's not when the black is at its, as, is at its highest point. So, to satisfy the anti-reflection condition, it places a rule that only special thicknesses will allow that to happen. What are those special thicknesses? Well, one such special thickness is when we have an integer number of wavelengths in our, in our thickness. You can see in that case if we have a node at x equals 0, we also get a node at the other end. If the backward wave amplitude is positive, Then we will get an anti-node at this interface at x equals zero, and then we also get an anti-node at the other end. Wh at what, when do we get the next possible solution that's just a little bit thicker? If I go a little bit bigger than two, when I get to a node, it looks like I got to a node right about here. I'll back up a bit, right about there. And it turns out that the correct number theoretically is a quarter. When I increase by a quarter of a wavelength, I get, I go from an anti-node at one end to a node at the other end. And then if I increase by another quarter wavelength to 2.5, like this, I get from a node, from an anti-node to another anti-node. So it's quarter wavelengths that seem to matter. So the message here, so only special thicknesses allow these conditions to be met at both boundaries. And if you, if you have an anti-node at one end, and you go to a node at the other end, then the thickness d ends up being an odd number times the wavelength in that medium over 4. An odd number of quarter wavelengths. And if, on the other hand, you satisfy these two conditions by having an antinode at one end and an anti-node at the other end, then sure enough the constraint is that you have a thickness which is an even number of quarter wavelengths. So we will exploit this farther in other tutorials. The take-home message from this one conceptually is that the boundary conditions at the two interfaces under the constraint that there's no reflected beam create a special situation where there's only three waves at each boundary that places a constraint which can only be met by having an antinode and a node at the two ends or antinode antinode or node node at the two boundaries and this means only special thicknesses of the middle layer can result in anti-reflection.